Hello everyone, I'm Anoop. I work with the Freiburg Galaxy team in Germany. In this talk, we will learn about regression in machine learning. In the previous talks, we focused on introduction to machine learning and then classification in machine learning. In this talk, we will learn about what is uh, regression uh, briefly, and then we will see uh, different approaches for regression. Regression, as we have discussed before, is a kind of supervised learning. We have a label. In difference to classification, the labels for regression task contains real numbers. For example, on the right, uh, there are two tables. Um, the top table, we can see that all the features are already real numbers. The target is also a real number. Using this top table, uh, we can train our model because we know the features and their targets. And in the bottom table, we can use the trained model to predict the target. We just know only the features and we can predict the target. Regression tasks actually require an error function. Error functions are mathematical functions which gives the difference between the true and the predicted values. There can be different examples of uh, cost functions, which we can see in the next slides. There are different approaches in regression, which can be used uh, depending on the data. There are linear models, such as linear regression, support vector machines, or more clearly, we can say support vector regressors. It has two variants, uh, linear and nonlinear both. There are k nearest neighbors approaches and then tree and ensemble approaches. We'll be seeing examples of all these uh, algorithms. Some examples of a real life um, regression tasks are predicting gene expression patterns. Gene expression patterns uh, has all real numbers uh, for for gene expression uh, corresponding to each gene. Then it can also be used for estimating DNA copy number. Some segments in, in any genome can be replicated, can be copied. Sometimes it's uh, doubled, sometimes it's tripled, sometimes it's quadrupled in different people. To estimate this DNA copy number, which is a number, regression algorithms can be used. Another task could be to identify drug responses uh, to th therapeutic, uh, 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 therapeutic changes uh, in the gene expression patterns. Cost function. Cost functions, as we discussed before, cost functions are mathematical functions. It actually used for computing the error between the true and the predicted targets. By this, we can say that whether our algorithm is doing good or not. If the error is too high, then uh, we assume that uh, the algorithm, the regressor is not uh, performing very good. If the error is very low, then we say that uh, the regressor is performing very good. Some common examples of cost function are mean squared error or mean absolute error or coefficient of determination and so on. One example of error could be if we see here is a true target, which is nine and the predicted target is 3.4. We can apply one of these error functions, for example, mean absolute error, then we subtract um, nine from 3.4 and we find what is the error. Now we see different uh, models or different algorithms uh, used for regression tasks. First one is a linear model. In the image at the bottom, we can see that the black dots are the, the targets which are plotted here we assume that uh, we have only two features uh, in this plot, uh, which can be easily plotted. And then a straight line is fit uh, through 
these uh, targets. This straight line is our learning curve, is our learning curve. Since linear models um, give straight lines, the, the equation for the straight line can be given as uh, y, which is the predicted target, uh, the quantity that we want to know, which can be equal to the w naught, which is the intercept of the straight line. And then for each feature, um, a coefficient is learned. And these coefficients are weight one, weight two, and up to weight n for each feature. All these uh, coefficients uh, can be merged together and, uh, and can be called as weights, which is a weight vector. We can also include the bias in the weight vector and it becomes the size of the weight vector becomes uh, n plus one. X is the input and it has uh, n features. The quantity that we see here on the right, this particular quantity, this is the mean squared error, which is actually minimized for learning in, in linear model, for example, in linear regression. So we solve this equation and find a set of weights which minimizes this equation. There are different examples of linear model, uh, linear regression, ridge regression, elastic net. They work on similar principles, but um, this minimization equation that we just discussed uh, differs a bit. These linear models um, are simple to understand and uh, they run fast. Uh, but the disadvantage is when we need to have a nonlinear boundary or nonlinear relations in the data, then these, ex these models uh, do not work well when we have non-linearities in our data. For those data sets, we need to use the non-linear models. Support vector machines. Support vector machines, or we can say support vector regressors, SVRs, um, they can be linear and non-linear, both. On the right, we can say that, uh, we can see that, um, there is this dark line, which is the, the, the separator between, between the boundaries. Support vector machines in general, they are maximum margin algorithm. The, the decision boundary is having the maximum distance from samples belonging to different classes. We need only the support vectors. The dark circles that we see here are the support vectors. We need only these vectors to classify a new sample. And the rest of the data we can throw away, which makes support vector machines highly memory efficient because uh, these support vectors are too few compared to all the data points. Advantages of su support vector machines are high dimensional data. It works well with high dimensional data. High dimensional data, we mean by high dimensional data is number of samples is too less compared to the number of features. But one thing we need to remember that um, it can be prone to overfitting when the data is highly dimensional. Therefore, we need to use uh, good regularization techniques to avoid that. It is highly memory efficient because it is used uh, only with support vectors and rest of the data uh, is already thrown away. Disadvantages uh, of support vector machines are, it has a large runtime, which increases with the data. Examples of support vector machines are SVR, this is support vector regressor, and uh, new SVR, and these are nonlinear variants, and linear SVR is the linear variant of support vector machines.
Now we discuss K nearest neighbors. K nearest neighbors approach is a very simple approach, which is easy to understand as it tries to find K neighbors around uh, each data point to predict a new sample. Advantages uh, of K nearest neighbor R is it is non-parametric. What we mean by non-parametric is this algorithm can learn any form of decision function. It's not restricted to some parameters. It can learn any form of function and and these, the size of the parameters actually increases with the data. It has to learn uh, many different parameters, which is one of the disadvantages of using k-nearest neighbors. And, and since it depends on a lot of parameters, which depends on the size of the data, the runtime increases. And also, it needs to keep all the neighbors of each data point it has high memory requirements. Also, it's uh, insensitive to outliers. But one of the good features of k neighbors is it can learn uh, irregular boundaries. So it's good for those data sets having a high degree of nonlinearity. On the right, we can see that um, <clears throat> We are using k-neighbors regressor, and uh, these are the target points uh, shown in yellow, and the blue line is the the, predict the, the prediction. In the bottom also um, is the same algorithm, but with a slightly different parameter, and we can see that uh, it is actually overfitting um, because it's just trying to learn and trying to fit all the data points and not generalizing too well. Decision trees. Decision trees learn simple decision rules based on the features in the data set. Let's suppose we have two features in the data set x1 and x2. On the right, uh, we can see that all these data points are plotted, x1 on the y-axis and x2 on the x-axis. Then we try to divide uh, the data set into two parts. Um, by this simple decision rule, x2 is less than 0 0.30. Then <clears throat> the, the entire data set, all the samples would be divided into two, one on the left and one on the, one set on the left and one set on the right. In this node here, we again make a decision, x1 less than 0.8. Now again, all the samples here would be divided into two parts. Similarly, uh, we say that uh, x1 is less than 0.88, which further divides the data set into two parts here, and further we move uh, downwards. These leaves actually give um, the categories that we have learned using these all decision rules. We, we can count these uh, categories as two, two, four, five, six, seven. Here we can see that th there are seven different parts uh, in the whole data set. Whenever a new sample comes in, then uh, a decision is evaluated and we need to follow only one of the paths here, which makes it an efficient learning algorithm. We see that our decision tree learns simple rules and for prediction, we need to follow one path. The advantages of our decision tree are, it's very easy to interpret as we saw in the simple example with two features here. And for prediction, we need to follow only one path and uh, it's logarithmic uh, cost for predicting a new sample. However, there are a few disadvantages of using decision trees. It's very sensitive to variations in the data. If the training and test data have uh, some variations, 
then it's it becomes um, prone to overfitting it it may give a very good accuracy on the training data but uh, it may perform poorly on the test data decision trees are also sensitive to imbalanced data sets if there is um, one class which is dominant then the data is uh, not balanced uh, data is not balanced because of the dominant classes and non-dominant classes and then it gives a very biased uh, model therefore it's very important to balance the data set uh, before using the decision trees to avoid the problems of using these decision trees we have ensemble models ensemble models is nothing but a combination of um, many many different trees there are two approaches to ensemble models bagging and boosting in bagging approach independent trees are built using the same data and then average prediction is taken from all of these decision trees which learns on the data in an independent way examples of bagging are random forest um, bagging regressor and extremely randomized trees regressor another ensemble model is boosting in boosting we take a few decision trees and then improve these uh, models sequentially and these models uh, try to combine weak models and fo and form a robust ensemble and then an average prediction is taken from these models examples of boosting are ada boost and gradient boosting and extra gradient boosting and so on on the right we can see that um, there are different trees um, in this ensemble model, 30 trees in this ensemble model, and each tree makes a prediction. And then we take an average prediction as the final prediction of an unseen data. Ensemble models generally give better accuracy in comparison to using single decision trees. But one of the disadvantages of ensemble models is it is computationally expensive if the data increases or if you use a lot of uh, decision trees as a uh, number of estimators then uh, the runtime increases in this talk we learned about uh, regression in general and then we talked about different uh, models of regression some are linear some are non-linear now we will go to the hands-on section where we will be using regression techniques we discussed here on our biological data hello everyone in this session we will be doing a hands-on on our biological data set and the task would be regression in the previous session uh, we discussed uh, what is regression briefly and different techniques uh, to do regression. Before going into the hands-on tutorial, let's uh, look at the training website of Galaxy. The, the link to the website is training.galaxyproject.org and we can see there are several tutorials uh, for different analyses. To find the tutorial that uh, we will be using for the hands-on session would be under statistics and machine learning. We open this category and we will find the regression in machine learning at the bottom. Let's open the tutorial. In this tutorial, um, we will see uh, background about regression and some background about the data sets that we would be using. Then 
we will be seeing how the different models of regression, different algorithms of regression are used. And then at the, at the end, we will be seeing uh, the visualization techniques to evaluate the performance of each of these uh, regression algorithms. And we will be also seeing uh, how to optimize the hyperparameters. In the introduction part, we discussed one of the hyperparameter optimization techniques, which is grid search. We will be using uh, the same grid search approach to optimize the hyperparameters of one of the regressors. Let's start the tutorial. We have discussed uh, already what is a regression. Regression is, is one of the tasks of supervised learning where the targets are real number. These real numbers, the targets can be anything. It can be a DNA copy number. It can be gene expression patterns. It can be biological age, which is the target in this hands-on session. To learn, we try to minimize a cost function. The cost function gives the error between the true and the predicted targets. There are different examples of cost function, such as mean squared error, mean absolute error, coefficient of determination or R squared error, and so on. In this tutorial, um, we'll be using a data set based on Yana Noe et al. study, which does a chronological age prediction using DNA methylation data sets. In, in this data set, uh, the the biomarkers are the genes which have the CPG sites which are DNA methylated. And these DNA methylated CPG sites have the highest correlation with the biological age. These number of genes, these biomarkers are 13 in number, which, having, which have the highest correlation with the age. And that's why uh, they are being used in the data set for predicting, for learning and predicting a biological age. You can learn more about uh, the, the original analysis in this paper, which is linked uh, in the tutorial. Also, uh, if you are interested, you can learn more about DNA methylation and CPG sites also. Um, uh, the, these are also linked. In DNA methylation, a methyl group gets attached uh, to one of the nucleotides. Uh, in this case, um, <clears throat> for CPG sites, uh, DNA methylation, for DNA methylation to occur, methyl groups get added to the cytosin uh, nucleotide. And because of that, uh, gene expression pattern changes. And by measuring the DNA methylation pattern of gene expression change, uh, it is also measured uh, against age as well, how these patterns are changing with age. And using this data set, uh, we'll be using uh, different regressors and see uh, how each of them performs. Just to reiterate, um, we will be using uh, regression techniques and analyze a DNA methylation data set. This data set is obtained from uh, blood cells. First of all, we'll be using uh, the, we'll be downloading the data sets and uploading them to Galaxy. Then we will use uh, a linear model, which is a simple model. Then we use the train model to predict using an unseen data set. Also, we will visualize the prediction, how good we are doing. Then we'll use um, ensemble method uh, for regression task. And then we will use another ensemble method uh, for hyperparameter optimization. We have already uh, discussed um, the regression a um, couple of times before. <clears throat> we can see in the plot uh, that the, the targets, which are blue circles, and the fitting curve is the red one. So this fitting curve uh, is, is plotted across the 
the targets. And this fitting curve is learned by uh, a regressor. When we have the data uh, or the targets of this kind uh, as shown in figure two, we can say that uh, <clears throat> there is a linear relationship. And if we use only a linear regressor, then we can find a very good fit already. But not always uh, we have this kind of uh, data set available. And in real, in, in real life, uh, many data sets have non-linearities. Therefore, it's good to uh, try out uh, non-linear algorithms as well to see if uh, performance is improved. Cost function, uh, we have mm, discussed briefly what is the cost function. Once again, uh, we should uh, look at the cost function. <clears throat> The blue circles or the blue dots um, are the targets of, uh, of a data set and the, and the black line is the curve uh, that is learned by the algorithm, which gives the uh, best fit through these uh, target points. Cost function tries to determine uh, the error between, between the true value and the predicted value. So the predicted value lies uh, across the the black line, which is the straight line curve, and the true value lies somewhere here. And we try to uh, minimize this distance by learning this curve. And this error is computed for each of the data points and then averaged. So whichever straight line gives uh, the lowest error is the best uh, straight line curve that that defines the, or that explains uh, the targets. We'll be, as discussed before, we'll be using um, a DNA methylation data set for this uh, tutorial. And we will apply um, a couple of scikit-learn algorithms uh, which are available in Galaxy uh, to predict biological age using DNA methylation patterns uh, of data sets. First of all, we need to um, download data sets into, into Galaxy. Um, before, going, before doing that, uh, let's go to Galaxy. This is uh, the homepage of Galaxy. On the left side, there are lots of tools which are actually different algorithms uh, for different analyses. So here we will find uh, our different regressors. On the right is the galaxy history where all the data sets are uploaded. In this history, <clears throat> so we did it for classification. For any new analysis like we will be doing here, it's always good to create a new history. Let's click on this plus button to create a new history. And then we give it a meaningful name. And now we try to upload all the data sets. The data sets, um, there are three data sets. Well, first one is the training data set, which is the train rows. The second data set is the test rows, which we'll, we'll be using for evaluation. This test rows uh, also contains the true labels. The third data set contains only the test rows without the labels. The second and third data set are actually the same. Only difference is the second data set contains true labels. The third data set we'll be using for prediction. Then we will have predicted targets, then we'll compare the, the predicted targets with the true targets from the second data set. These data sets are also available on Zenodo. We go there and we can have a look. Um, we, we have all these data sets available here. We can also download and get a view of all these data sets. To copy these data sets, um, Either we can just uh, select and copy all these links 
otherwise, alternatively, we can just uh, go here and copy all these uh, links of the data sets. <clears throat> to upload the data set into Galaxy, we will click on Upload Data. Then we go to Paste Fetch Data and we just paste all the links. We need uh, tabular data sets. Therefore, it's always good to type a uh, tabular data set here. And uh, we just start the analysis, start the data upload process. It all turns green and then we close it. Now we can see here, uh, all these three data sets are in queue and soon uh, they will be uploaded when all of them turns green. We can wait a bit here. <clears throat> so uh, the steps that I followed here, um, these steps are also written. We just copy all the links and then go to paste fetch data and then start the process. We should also rename the data sets. Um, as, as we see here, uh, all these data sets have their links appended to their names. Um, it may not be meaningful. Also, these are very big names. So it's good to have a small and meaningful names here. Once they turn yellow, um, once they start getting uploaded, we can change the names of the data sets. Also, we should also check that the data type of all these three data sets is tabular. If it is not tabular, if it is, uh, for example, um, comma separated or text file, then our uh, algorithms will not work. Our data sets are uploaded. Let's now rename these data sets. We, we will click on these uh, edit attributes uh, pencil icon and uh, this screen is shown to us. Then we just uh, remove these links here and save it. Similarly, we will do for the remaining two data sets. Now we have uh, meaningful names to our data sets and we can see uh, browse through these data sets. We can see that we have 105 uh, rows for the data set, test data set, and it has 13 um, columns. These columns are the genes, and all these numbers are the DNA methylation patterns recorded. The, these are the same test rows, but in this data set, we also have age as uh, one column which is the true targets for these uh, data set rows. This is the, these are the train rows and we have 209 lines and 209 rows. The first row is the, the column names and we can, we'll not be using uh, this row, first row for training. Only uh, 208 uh, rows we'll be using for training and we also have uh, the targets defined, the age defined for each row. We go to the tutorial. We have uh, uh, done all these steps here. Here, the, the numbers of rows is defined, which we have already discussed. We have 208 rows corresponding to um, individual samples. So it's coming from different people. And for each row, there are 13 um, features. And the last column, the age column, uh, defines the target. Similarly, the test set contains 104 rows coming from 104 different people and age defines uh, the target, the biological age. First of all, uh, we'll be using a linear model for uh, training on the DNA methylation data set and then predict the, the age. In the hands-on section here, we'll try to find this particular tool in Galaxy. 
we select this text and go to Galaxy and try to find this particular tool. Is it? Yeah, so it's right here. We just make it a bit smaller here. Now, this is a generalized linear model. So it contains both a classification and regression models. Uh, together, we're using regression model here. Let's go back to the definition. We need to um, specify a regression a trainer model and then we use a linear regression model from this which is right here now our data is tabular we will select tabular data now we have two sections first we need to select all the features and then we need to select uh, the target the targets uh, can be selected here to do that uh, first we select the training sample data set we select the train rows. Our data sets contain header. We have seen this. Uh, these are the headers here. These are the headers, uh, which are gene names. Then we say, uh, yes, our data set has headers. Since our features and targets are contained in the same data set, we need to separate them. Therefore, uh, this option comes in handy. Now we need only the features, only the gene names. Therefore, we will choose this option, all columns excluding some column header name, which will select everything excluding the header name that we type here. So we have typed um, age. Therefore, the, it will take into account all the columns except the age, which contain our features. Now to select the feature and the targets, we select the same data set because the feature, the, the targets are also present here and it contains header. And now we need to select only one column, the target column. There, therefore, we choose option select columns by header name. And we use the same header name here. We can see that we have done the same things as specified in the tutorial. Then we go on and run the model. We can see that uh, a new data set is created, but it's still queued in Galaxy and the job has not started running. We can go back to the tutorial <clears throat> and try to answer this question. What is learned by a linear regressor? As we have seen in the presentation that um, linear algorithms learn uh, a straight line uh, curve. So the function and the straight line, um, these are the coefficients that we need, which is actually learned by the regressor and using those weights which are the coefficients for each feature, we can predict uh, the target for a new sample. Let's see, uh, we can see that our job is running now. And meanwhile, uh, we can uh, move on to predicting uh, age using the test data set. Now test data set does not contain any age information. We will try to predict it using um, uh, using the model that we have learned here. This is our learned model. And then uh, we need to use the same tool as we have used before, but now uh, we will be using it in a different mode. First, we used it as a train model, but the, uh, the second we used loader model and predict. For that, we need to have two input data sets. First one is the model which is automatically selected. And the second is uh, the data set that we want to predict on, the test rows. 
our test rows data set contains header we just make it as yes and we want to predict uh, class labels here the class labels are the real number targets let's just verify that uh, we have done the same things yes we have done it right and then we execute it this data set will create uh, uh, predictions for all the rows and these predictions are the age the the data set is already running now to see uh, to compare the performance uh, we need some visualization tools we have some visualization tools in galaxy which we can use and uh, evaluate the performance or uh, visualize the performance of all the tools that uh, we are using before using the visualization uh, we need to do um, a removal um, of the headers from the data set which we'll be using now uh, this data set is already finished and we it's a tabular data set and we can actually uh, visualize it <clears throat> we can see that the last column is is predicted based on all these uh, features and our trained model last column is the predicted age and now we'll be using our true data set um, and try to see uh, how good we are doing before that uh, we need to remove the headers because this data set does not contain any header so we will go for it and we go to test row labels <clears throat> we also should rename uh, our predicted file so that we remember in future that which data set we are dealing with therefore we have it and also we will rename this data set without the header as well and we just rename it by clicking on the pencil icon both our data sets are renamed now we can <clears throat> easily use the visualization tool here let's um, copy this name of the tool and search it in galaxy tool search Now we have uh, this tool definition open. It has two parameters. Uh, first is the input data file and second is the predicted data file. Input data file will contain the data set containing the true targets. So the true targets are present in test rows labels without header and the predicted data file is in predicted data linear. And then we will <clears throat> run this job um, this will be uh, generating three different plots um, when until uh, these jobs turn green we can see the results already in the in the tutorial first um, first plot is actually the comparison plotting of the real values the true and predicted values as as a point uh, plots here the blue points here give the true values and the predicted values are in orange color and these are and on x-axis we see is the number of data points we have 108 points uh, in the test set 108 rows in the test set and for each row we get uh, true and predicted values we can see that um, for most of the rows in the test set we are getting true and we are getting close uh, true and predicted values which says that the performance is is good 
the when these blue and orange uh, points differ from each other for each point on the x axis then then we can say that our performance is not good because true and predicted values are far from each other then we see uh, the scatter plot the scatter plot um, plots um, predicted and true values for a good performance um, most of the points should stay along this orange line this is x equal to y curve which says that the true and predicted values uh, lie on the x equal to y curve because they are very close to each other if these points are scattered around the x and y x equal to y curve then our prediction is not good in this plot we can also see that um, root mean squared error is 4.1 which says that uh, the we are predicting the biological age with an error of with an average error of 4.1 years for example uh, if the true target is uh, 50 then uh, we are either predicting um, around 46 years uh, or 54 years the r2 score is 0.93 we will discuss about r2 score uh, soon um, just to give um, a brief introduction about r2 score is if it is closer to 1.0 our prediction is very good if it is a negative number or very small number then our prediction for regression is not good and r squared is uh, one of the error functions that is used in classif in regression tasks the third plot is the residual plot a residual plot uh, plots the predicted targets against uh, the residual residual is predicted target minus the true target so it can be a negative value um, uh, predicted minus uh, true values or a positive one how to analyze this plot if this plot contains uh, points which are randomly scattered around uh, y equal to zero line then we say that uh, our prediction is good if it shows any kind of pattern then then our performance uh, we can say that our performance uh, is suffering from some problem these points should be distributed along uh, the y equal to zero line and should not show any pattern using these three plots we can judge the performance of our algorithm in different ways our jobs are actually finished and uh, let's just collapse the tool section here so that we have a bigger area let's click on uh, actual versus predicted curve so here <clears throat> in this interactive plot we can see uh, for one uh, for one row um, the true value is 66 and we are predicting uh, around 59 for another another point we we can see that uh, the true value is 68 years and we are predicting as 65.33. Uh, there are some not so good ones predictions uh, of 69 and 60, but there are also some very good ones. Uh, for example, if for this particular row um, in the test set, 65 is the true target and 65.53 is the predicted. Let's open uh, the scatter plot as well. So here we can see that uh, most of the data points lie along uh, the x equal to y score, x equal to y curve, and which says that uh, the, the predicted and true values are close to each other. However, the, we can see some, uh, some predictions uh, which are far away from the true targets and some which or many which are close to y, x equal to y line. The idea is most of the uh, points in this plot should lie uh, along the x equal to y line. The third plot, as we saw there, is the residual plot. And we see here the points are <clears throat> scattered around the y equal to zero line and do not show any, any distinguishable pattern. 
we'll be making uh, the same plots uh, for different regressors as well. Now let's go to the tutorial and learn a bit more about uh, coefficient of determination. Coefficient of determination, uh, also called R2 or R squared cost function, it's uh, popularly used uh, for a regression task as a uh, as a metric of performance. Let's see uh, in this figure eight, uh, all these points are are scattered around uh, the x equal to y curve, and uh, we see that the r squared score is is negative, which is a bad performance. Therefore, these points are scattered. If we have uh, most of the data points that lie very, very close to x equal to y curve, then our performance is very high. Here we see that it's almost uh, the best performance because um, the, the maximum value R square can get is 1.0 and the minimum value is any negative number, any negative number which can go back to uh, a very large number. We have one question here to answer. Um, since we inspect the plots, inspected the plots, so what can we say about the predictions? So from the figures five, six, and seven, we can say that the prediction is good and acceptable. We have a high R squared score, which is 0.93, and the predicted and true age for most of the predicted samples are in the test uh, set. Uh, they are good and they are very close and which gives an idea of a good performance. Till now we have used a linear regression model for predicting biological age using DNA methylation data sets. Using linear models is always good to start with but it is not the best approach. Uh, we should always uh, try to use non-linear models to see if we can do better. Therefore, uh, in this section of the tutorial, we will be using ensemble method for regression task to predict a biological age using the DNA methylation data set. So one, one example of nonlinearity we can see in figure 10 that uh, the targets are scattered uh, like a curve. If we try to fit all these uh, target points um, through a straight line, then we will not get the best results. Therefore, to have this uh, explained, all these targets, target points explained, we need to use some nonlinear algorithm uh, to find the right uh, curve to explain most of the points in the target. In the ensemble uh, suite, uh, there are lots of algorithms to be used as regressors. For example, random forest regressors, ADA boost regressor, gradient boosting regressor. In this approach, we will use grad gradient boosting uh, regressor. The paper that we are dealing with here and we are using the data from, they used a random forest, which is uh, ensemble based regressor, as I just mentioned before. And then we compare the performance uh, of both of these uh, regressors. Let's go to the um, hands-on section. We need to use an, a tool named as ensemble method for classification and regression. We copy the text and go to Galaxy and try to find this tool. We found this tool and then we open the definition of the tool and then we see uh, what options uh, we need to we need to do <clears throat> we want to train a model uh, okay 
So it has not loaded so far, and then we can wait uh, for a few seconds. Then we need to select um, the ensemble method as gradient boosting regressor. We need to be careful uh, with it because um, in the same dropdown, we will find gradient boosting classifier as well. So it's better to be careful not to choose this particular, otherwise it will give a uh, failed uh, data set. This is now uh, open and we select our train a model and then we select a gradient boosting regressor. Our data is already tabular and all these options remain the same. Here we need to select train rows. Our train rows has headers and we want to select only the features. Therefore, we will exclude uh, the age column from this data set, which will give us all the feature columns. Now we need to select only the target values. We will select the same data set because it contains the target as well. This data set has headers. And now we want to select only one column. We select uh, this option, select columns by header name. And we select age here and try to put the age uh, here and then execute this job. Then <clears throat> the, the data set is already created, um, but the job has not uh, started running. Meanwhile, uh, we can go back um, to, the, to the tutorial and try to answer this question. Uh, what is learned by gradient boosting regressor? <clears throat> Gradient boosting regressor has uh, several attributes which are actually learned uh, internally by the algorithm using the data. One of those attributes is feature importances. We know that um, we have several features uh, in, in the training data. For each feature, this regressor gives an important score. How important a particular feature is. If the feature value is higher in magnitude, then the feature is very important and uh, highly co correlated with the age or the target in general. Uh, if the feature importance magnitude is a small number, then it's not so much correlated. To do feature engineering, um, for example, um, if let's say if there are a lot of features, then we can do feature engineering and try to remove all those features having small feature importance values, which will improve the runtime of the algorithm. Then there are number of estimators, how many estimators uh, uh, <clears throat> and what kind of estimators are there. And there are many more such as uh, such as OOB improvement. Uh, OOB improvement stores incremental improvement. Since gradient boosting follows a boosting approach and there are only few uh, trees which are weak learners and they try to improve themselves sequentially and incrementally to finally form a robust ensemble model. So the OOB improvement stores that uh, change. Our jobs get finished and we get uh, this trained model here. And now we will use this trained model uh, for predicting the test rows. We use an ensemble model because um, gradient boosting is an ensemble method and we're using actually the same tool. And, but now with a different mode, uh, load a model and predict. It needs uh, two data sets, um, the model, which is the gradient boosting regressor and the test uh, rows without the true age. Our data set contains header and we want to predict uh, the targets. Then we execute this. <clears throat> we just copy this, um, this text so that we can rename our new data set. Let's go to 
the pencil icon and then rename this data set as predicted uh, data using gradient boosting. Um, using this um, predicted uh, data set, we can plot uh, our different visualization to see uh, how good we are doing with the ensemble model. Um, we have this tool available. <clears throat> In this tool, uh, we need to select uh, two values as the input data file, which are test row labels. We just confirm from uh, the tool definition here. Yes, it's the test row labels. And then we want to use predicted data and uh, we just execute it. It will give the same uh, plots here and we see how good we are doing with the ensemble model. As long as uh, these jobs are not finished, we can look at the plots here. We can see uh, in this scatter plot, in most of the data points lie along uh, x equal to y line, which is good. And the root mean squared error is 3.85. If you go, um, or if you remember what was the root mean squared error with the linear model, it was 4.1. We can just uh, get it confirmed with the linear model. We can see that uh, with the linear model, it was 4.1. And with the ensemble model, it is uh, 3.85. Let's just look at uh, the data set which just got created here. <clears throat> so uh, we can see uh, the root mean squared error is 3.85 years, which means that we are predicting with uh, an with an error of 3.8 years, 8.5 years. Let's look at the residual plot. These files are a little bit bigger, uh, so it takes some time to load. So these um, residual plot uh, between the predicted values and the residual, the difference between the predicted and true values. Uh, these points are scattered uh, all across the y equal to zero line and they don't show any kind of pattern, which is good. And that shows that the performance is, is good. Then we can also see the actual versus predicted uh, curve. Here also we can see that um, <clears throat> the predicted values lie close to the uh, true values for most of the points in the test data, which says that uh, our performance is reasonably good. We saw that um, we get we got a slight improvement in performance compared to performance by using ensemble model in comparison to using linear model. Now we will try to use um, a hyperparameter search technique to see that uh, if we can still do better because um, any machine learning algorithm has lots of hyperparameters which needs to be um, optimized for better performance. For this to um, do, we first need to build uh, a pipeline, which, uh, which is a package for, for pre-processing steps and um, estimators. So currently in this particular tutorial, we are not using any pre-processing steps, but uh, in the pipeline, we are just using um, the the algorithm, the gradient boosting algorithm. But in, in real life, uh, we should use uh, some pre-processing techniques with the data and then use uh, uh, estimators because um, raw data contains uh, lots of uh, noise and outliers which should be removed to get a very good performance on 
on the data. Let's try to find this pipeline builder. We just try to find it here, the pipeline builder tool. In this tool, uh, as I mentioned before, we can use pre-processing steps. We can choose different types of transformations here on the data, which will be applied uh, sequentially. We can also add many different uh, pre-processing steps one after another. But in this step, we are not doing that. We will just use uh, the final estimator, which is our regressor. Since uh, gradient boosting is an ensemble method, we will go to sklearn ensemble scikit-learn ensemble and then we will find the option of using gradient boosting regressor then we go to um <clears throat> we just put a, a random state equal to 42 here which um <clears throat> which is nothing but uh to to find the repeatable performance uh, every time we run the experiment. We need output parameters for search CV, yes. Uh, we want to have this uh, so that we can set the hyperparameters. Here we will see that in the, in the next step. And then we execute this pipeline builder. This pipeline builder uh, will return two data sets. Um, First one is uh, is a list, is a tabular list of all the hyperparameters of gradient boosting regressor. And the default values will be also present there. And the second one is a zip file, which is uh, the pipeline uh, containing the estimator algorithm. We have finished this step and waiting for the results to, to come. <clears throat> now we will use uh, another tool for actually searching for the hyperparameter. In this tool, um, two options are there. First one is grid search, another one is random. In grid search, we will specify discrete values of each hyperparameter we want to optimize. While in the random search, we will use a range from which uh, the algorithm will sample a value and then use it for a particular hyperparameter. The default value, the hyperparameter that we want to optimize here is the number of estimators. The default value of the estimator for gradient boosting regressor is 100. But we, we don't know if uh, 100 is the optimal value. Therefore, we will choose uh, some values which are less than 100 and some values uh, which are more than 100 to see um, if we are getting a better performance or, or to be more specific, we are getting a lesser root mean squared error or higher R squared scores. <clears throat> this search of hyperparameters will be done through a five-fold cross-validation. Uh, we discussed it briefly in five-fold cross-validation. The entire data set, the entire training data set is divided into five equal parts and four parts uh, is used for training and one part is for validation. And the validation set as shown in this example image, that validation set uh, keeps shifting uh, so that each part or each sample uh, will be used uh, for training and test uh, as validation both. And the accuracy we will be getting for each iteration, for each fold, and then we will be averaging uh, the accuracy. So similarly, we can do a three-fold cross-validation or 10-fold cross-validation as well. Our jobs got finished here the pipeline um, builder tool that we ran uh, a few minutes before. Let's look at this tabular data, what it contains. 
we can see that there are different parameters. Um, actually, these are hyperparameters uh, of the algorithm, uh, which can be uh, set by uh, the users. And depending on this value, the performance of the algorithm varies. Therefore, we need to find some default values already set, but we need to find the right values for our data. To use uh, this hyperparameter search tool, first we will try to find this tool in Galaxy's tool suite. Here is our tool. Uh, the tool definition is open. So as I explained before, uh, we have two approaches for hyperparameter search, grid search and randomized search. In this tutorial, we will use uh, grid search. It takes several uh, files and parameters, and we will be using um, the help from the tutorial and fill in the right values. We have already selected a grid search CV and uh, our pipeline estimator object uh, data file uh, is already this one, and it's already loaded here. Now, the estimator is not a deep learning model, so it should be no. Now we need to select uh, the file containing the parameter names. We should select uh, this particular file. And when we select this file, this dropdown with the parameter name will be automatically selected. Now uh, we should see which particular hyperparameter we need to optimize. We should find it. We want to optimize um, N estimators. Therefore, we just selected n estimators and the default value of this is 100. <clears throat> now we should give uh, a search list which contains uh, a list of different values that n estimators should take instead of 100. For, for, for first iteration, it will take n estimators equal to 25. In the next iteration, it will take 50 and then 75 and then 100 and then 200. For each of this iteration, it will report an accuracy and the best one will be taken out. Since uh, we have many other hyperparameters to, to tune, we can add insert parameter search and choose, uh, let's say, alpha and specify different values of alpha just like here but we are not optimizing it. And um, therefore we will not be using more parameters. Let's go back to the tutorial and see uh, what options we need to set for advanced options. We need to select the primary metric for scoring. The primary metric for scoring is R squared. Therefore we select the R squared here and now we should uh, select how, what is the cross validation split here we select a uh, k fold cross validation and we will be using um, we will be using uh, five splits the data will be split into five equal parts we can specify here 10 then data set will be divided into 10 equal parts. And it should be at least two, which we should not specify less than one, less than two, because it won't make any sense. So using k-fold, uh, it will divide the data um, uh, in a contiguous way. Then <clears throat> before splitting, we want to shuffle the data, yes. And we can specify some seed number to get uh, repeatable results. Then we try to see what different options we need to set. Um, another one is raise fit error. Uh, yes, IID is already set.
So a race fit error is no here, uh, which means that uh, if you specify some values in the search um, in the search list, uh, and this value causes an, causes an error, then our program will stop. If we specify that uh, as no, then uh, if it encounters any error, then um, execution will keep running and it will just uh, simply skip that value, which is good for us because uh, we don't want to take a, a wrong number, uh, which is not the, which will not give any results and it will just waste uh, the time. Now, uh, all the advanced options are finished. Now we will select the input data type uh, as before. Our data type is tabular. Now we want to select all the features from the train rows and we select this data set and we contain our data set contains header and we want to exclude the age column from the features list. And in the second part, uh, we just want to select only the target column and therefore we will select that column by header name. Then we go back to this definition and see if we are doing it right. Or test separately, no, and whether to hold, uh, yeah. And we want to save the best estimator. As we know, as we discussed before that, um, uh, against each um, tested value of the N estimators, there will be a uh, a different model. Uh, we want to find the best estimator, uh, which gives the best performance for the estimator chosen. And we will be using this uh, trained uh, best trained estimator to to predict for the test rows. Now we execute this tool. This tool will be generating two data sets. First one is the best estimator. Uh, for the best hyperparameter set. And the second is the hyperparameter, is the detailed results of the hyperparameter search, which will be a tabular file. And it will have all the information, uh, what hyperparameters um, we optimized and what are the ranks and what is the accuracy uh, for each uh, tested hyperparameter. What is the time for uh, finishing the the job for for each value it's also important because if you specify higher number of estimators it will take a larger time to finish so <clears throat> Since we have used an ensemble method uh, as an estimator and for predicting the age, we need to use ensemble method for classification and regression. Therefore, we'll go to the um, tool section and try to find this tool again. So in the meantime, uh, our job has not started. Um, yeah. So uh, we go down and okay, uh, maybe it's in the top. Yeah, it's at the top. So we have found the tool. Now uh, we need to run this tool in the prediction mode. <clears throat> Let's go back to the tutorial and this ensemble method for classification and regression. Now we need uh, to use the load and model predict option. Um, the model that we want to use, it's still not finished, but it's data is, uh, is, is generated, the file is generated and uh, we can still use it and make it in queue. The prediction data is the test rows here, and the data set contains header. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We want to predict uh, the class labels, which is uh, the age, uh, which are real numbers. And then we can execute this tool. We can still execute this tool, but it will not produce any data. Uh, it will produce some results only when these jobs uh, get finished. We can still do that. So and meanwhile, we can see that uh, the jobs have started running already. So this particular tool uh, will return one file, which is the predicted um, with the predicted test rows with the predicted age. <clears throat> we can use the same plotting tools to plot the performance of, of this ensemble method, but with, uh, with the best hyperparameter. So uh, the input data file would be the file with the true age information and the predicted data file would be our this particular file which is getting generated and now we can execute uh, this tool <clears throat> similar to um, previous plotting examples we will be getting uh, three plots again and we can see that uh, this job got finished and this job um, has given us the predicted age. We can see uh, here the predicted uh, column is, is the age, the predicted age, and we'll compare it with the true age. Another uh, data set uh, we should look at is the hyperparameter search data set. This data set contains uh, all the information, uh, what was done uh, in hyperparameter search operation. We can see that uh, N estimators attribute or hyperparameter we try to optimize and the different values that we used uh, got listed here. Um, and the accuracy with the mean test score is also listed here. And we can say that uh, the N estimators with rank one has the highest accuracy uh, in this particular hyperparameter search. The default estimator is giving an accuracy of 90.91 and uh, the N estimator is giving an accuracy of 0.9146, which is slightly higher. And these scores are actually R squared scores. Closer it is uh, to 1.0, better it is. There are other options um, or column names which can be explored. So since we specified um, five-fold cross-validation, so the accuracy is given for each fold, uh, fold zero, fold one, and fold four, these five folds. We can also see that uh, when the estimators um, are less then the fit time, the, the training time is less. And when the number of estimators are increasing and uh, the fit time is also increasing. <clears throat> let's look at the plots. First of all, let's look at the residual plot. So again, we see that uh, the points are scattered across y equal to x line and no visible pattern. Therefore, the performance uh, we expect uh, to be good. Then we look at the scatter plot. We can see that um, the, most of the points lie across uh, y equal to x line 
and uh, the root mean squared error is 3.76 and the squared uh, r squared is 0.94 with the ensemble method without hyperparameter optimization uh, we got uh, 3.85 years as root mean squared error but now we have improved it to 3.76 which says that uh, it's important um, to optimize the hyperparameters of an algorithm to see if we can do better. We go to see um, actual versus predicted uh, values. So here are the points on the true and predicted uh, values. And we see that most of the points uh, lie close to each other as uh, the prediction error is only 3.76 years on an average. Let's go back to the tutorial. And we see um, the same similar plots here. after doing the hyperparameter search. A residual plot has no patterns and most of the data points lie across the y equal to x line and the true and predicted values for each sample in the test set uh, it's close to each other. So um, in comparison to Jan and Noe, uh, study, which used a random forest as a regressor, it achieved 3.93 uh, years as root mean squared score. And with our hyperparameter search and gradient boosting uh, algorithm, we achieved uh, 3.7 uh, as the R squared score. Therefore, we did uh, slightly better than this paper. <clears throat> Therefore, it's very important to optimize the hyperparameters of the algorithm. And this tutorial also shows that uh, the machine learning tools in Galaxy, we can achieve uh, state-of-the-art uh, predictions using machine learning uh, regressors and classifiers as well. With this, uh, we reach uh, to the conclusion of this tutorial. In this tutorial and the presentation before, we learned uh, what is regression, the basic concepts of regression, uh, what are the different techniques to do regression. For example, there are linear models which try to fit a straight line across the targets. Then there are nonlinear models for um, learning the nonlinearities in the data. Then we saw uh, what are the different uh, visualization plots which can be used uh, to evaluate the performance of a regressor and at the end uh, we saw how using hyperparameter search algorithms can improve the performance of an algorithm because there are many hyperparameters and the ideal values are not fixed for them they vary from data to data and problem to problem Therefore, it's important to optimize the hyperparameters. I hope um, you learned something new using this tutorial. You can try out um, different uh, regressors on the same data, or alternatively, you can use a different data set and try to use uh, different algorithms on that. For example, we didn't use a pre-processing technique. You can try out uh, different pre-processing techniques on a raw data set and then use hyperparameter search techniques, uh, maybe the random search and see, um, and see and compare the results across different algorithms. Thank you. At the end of the tutorial, you will find a feedback section. Let us improve the content of the tutorial by giving your invaluable feedback. Thanks a lot.